listening to Non Sequitur. The Audacity of Reason. Season 1, Episode 12. Irreverent, a spirited message of less dogma and more sex. Featuring special guest, Reverend Stephanie Clark. Each week, Non Sequitur goes live, bringing you the, the most interesting and controversial discussions held between the leading voices on a variety of issues. To make sure you never miss a show, please visit www.youtube.com slash non sequitur show and subscribe now. For upcoming shows, past episodes and ways to support the show, please visit www.nonsexshow.com. That's N-O-N-S-E-Q show.com. And now, here are your hosts. Kyle Curtis and Steve McRae. And joining us now is the irreverent reverend herself, Stephanie Clark. Stephanie, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for inviting me on the show. It's so gl- We're so glad that you're here. For someone that may not be familiar with you, can you kind of give us a synopsis of who you are, what you do, and what makes you different. Okay. Well, you can probably hear I was born in Britain. Uh, didn't really have a religious upbringing at all, which I'm most grateful for because it means I have less baggage to work through. And I, I had a spiritual leanings that I didn't really understand for the longest time. And then I ended up uh, emigrating to South Africa where I discovered the first church of religious science. And for most people who are listening, if they under, if they know the name Louise Hay, she was one of the early proponents of the science of mind. And she was able to speak about the teaching in a way that made it human and easy to apply in a person's life. I came across her work and it turned out that when I discovered the first church of religious science in Johannesburg, that uh, this was Louise Hay's teaching. And I most people think Louise Hay created that teaching herself, but she didn't. It was It's called Science of Mind. So I started studying uh, spiritual growth, and that's what I knew I had been looking for all along. And the religions that I'd come across in my earlier life had not spoken to what it was that I was looking for at all. But Science of Mind did. And for me, the difference between should I go into that now? The difference between traditional religion and science of mind or spiritual? Sure, I think that's a good um, – because I was, I was sitting here, you know, as someone who – I grew up Southern Baptist in the mm. Bible belt of the, the states. And I'm used to the concept of you have to keep a ruler in between you and if you're dancing with somebody. If you're even allowed to dance at all, you know, some Baptist churches, you're not even allowed to – dance with anyone of the opposite sex you until have to you're married for the Holy ghost. Right. Right. So <laughs> let's, let's pretend like we're, we're looking at this from somebody in that perspective. Like this is a, cause I, I've read up on it, but this is a completely, I think departure from what people think religion is. And I think that it's important for people to see that there are alternatives out there and some that you might not, ever knew existed. So kind of contrast the two and what makes them so starkingly different. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'd say the big difference for me is that in traditional religion, there's a sense that there's a big God, usually a daddy God up there somewhere in (laughs) in the sky, who's uh, supposed to be a God of love, but actually quite a punishing, violent figure and quite warlike. And we as humans are peons, we're worms in the dust, we are powerless victims, and we have to pray to and appease this God if we're going to have anything in our life that's worth living for. Well said. Um, (laughs) (laughs) That sums it up. So then for me, the spiritual teaching that I'm a part of the the basic idea is that there's only one power, so it's not a male anthropomorphic God, it's a it's a power. It's not a human. And it's and we are one with that. So one God and we are its emanations or its I don't like the word children because again there's a bit of a status going on there, a difference in a bigger God and a smaller human. So we're emanations. It's like the drops of water in the ocean. We have all the same qualities. 
So created in the image and likeness of the divine means that I am a divine being. And that just as much as the creative power of the universe created everything, I also create. So I'm made in the image and likeness. I am made creative. So my creative power is in my thought and my words, my thinking and my my speaking. So as I think along the lines of truth, truth, okay, let me define truth. So if I think along the lines of there's only one power and I am that, and that power is good, it's a power for good, it's a power of love. If my thinking is based on love, my life is amazing. When Mm -hmm. I think in terms of separation, like I'm separate from God, I'm separate from love, I'm separate from money, or I'm separate from health, or I'm separate from satisfaction and fulfillment, then my life is not amazing. My life reflects those negative thoughts and beliefs. And the whole point of the science of mind teaching is to really work with that that notion that it's done unto you as you believe. Jesus said it's done unto you as you believe. And the way Christians typically interpret that is, if I believe in Jesus Christ, that he came to earth to save me for my sins, I will be saved. That's the kind of Christian, that's my understanding of how Christians see things. So the way that we interpret that in science of mind is, it's done unto you as you believe, meaning that whatever you believe to be true about yourself, about life, about other people, about the world, that will show up in your experience on earth. So if I believe that I'm totally loved everywhere I go, that will be my experience. If I believe that no matter how hard I try, money always slips through my fingers, that will be my experience. So the the whole purpose of the teaching is to is to work with our thought life and become more and more loving, kind, expanded and thinking along the lines of possibility and what can I give to this life? How can I contribute? How can I serve? Where can I express my gifts and talents and abilities? How can I make the world a better place? By being true to who I am as a divine being. I think this, I mean, this, this, this entire, I guess, category of religion just really fascinates me, I think, because to me, it's interesting to see how different people think about um, the afterlife and if, if there's a higher power. My question is, do you guys have a central, I guess, do you have a central deity that you, that you look to? I guess would be the best way to put it. Or, or, or is it kind of like a we are all collective as like you were saying, the, the drops in, in the water. Is that kind of the, the way that it goes? Or do you actually have a central like hierarchy of deities, I guess? A I know that's confusing. <laughs> yeah. Is, it, yeah, is, like, is there a monotheism component or is it more like a panpsychism? Definitely monotheistic, but not in the same way that a Christian or a, uh, or Islam, Christianity or Islam or, or Judaism would be monotheistic because it's, again, it's a power, not a person. It's a power. So we don't worship in the sense of the way Christians worship God. We don't I worship think. this one power. Um, but we do acknowledge that it's, it's hard to describe, isn't it? It's always finding language is always the tricky thing. But um, I understand. I, the, the more I grow, the more I research, the more I learn, the more I'm moving away from the concept of an outer God or a higher God or some, some power that's an authority over my life. So, but I do still know, believe that there is a power other than me. I am not the God of the universe. I'm God in the flesh, but I'm not the God of the universe. So there's a power that's bigger than me that Stephanie cannot um, heal a cut. Stephanie cannot mend a bone. You know that that I don't have that power. There's a power flowing through me that's bigger than me that can create, that can heal, that can restore balance and order. So, do we worship them? You know, I think that uh, the more that you and I grow spiritually, the more aligned we become with who we essentially are as divine beings the less outer gods we worship. So like I I no longer worship the God of money. I no longer worship the God of sex. I no longer worship the God of alcohol. (laughs) Withdrawing power that I've given to outer forces and becoming less of a victim to 
powers that I perceive to be outside of myself. You kind of place where, where you may not have a name for it or a, um, a, a title. You place kind of a center there that you kind of pull from. And you pulling from that center allows you to kind of pass off the, I guess, what you would call the bad traits or the, the things that you used to be beholden unto in order to make yourself more on the level of that thing in which you were originally drawing from. So it's almost like you're taking back the control that that you want saw in something else. Is that kind of mm. the... Yeah, I think that's good. Yep, that, that sums it up. But you're not so, anthropomorphizing any of these things, right? I mean, the, the god of the money is just a, a way of experiencing the... Uh, you, you giving, he said, as Kyle put it, giving something to them, to it, uh, it's a control factor. Instead of letting them control mm -hmm. your life, you're saying that you're just calling it, calling it a god of money, although that's not what you would find in most like, deifications. It's not a deity per se, it's just that you are giving it control, therefore you're you're treating it as a, as a higher type entity, but not really a, a being of any kind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well said. Very articulate. Thank you. What What is the – can you give us kind of a, like a brief history of, of where this kind of stemmed from? You kind of went over how you found it, but take us back farther. Where did this originally kind of begin, if you know, or is it just kind of something that materialized recently? Like was it just a collective group of people that said, you know, we feel the same way about – you know, X, Y, and Z, or does this stem backwards, you know, Christianity or, or your standard run of the mill religions would, would go? No, I can, I can answer it. Uh, so the, the founder of the teaching, the science of mind, his name was Ernest Holmes. And mm -hmm. he grew up in the late uh, 1800s in, on the East coast of America. And he came from a very strict Christian household. Um, and he, as he grew older, read very widely. He read philosophy, religion, the world's religions, and he began to notice the salient truth that ran through all major world religions. And he realized from his reading in philosophy as well that the, the human mind is creative. So he put together the teaching called the science of mind, but he had also great teachers. He learned from Mary Baker Eddy, who was the founder of Christian science, and her star student was Emma Curtis Hopkins. So Emma Curtis Hopkins was a mystic of note, and she taught Ernest Holmes. And there were other teachers, too, that arose at this time. You've probably heard of the Unity Church. Mm -hmm. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore started the Unity Church. So, this, so Emma Curtis Hopkins taught Ernest Holmes, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. And then I think it was Nona Cox who started Divine Science. So towards the end of the 1800s, these the called New Thought teachings were emerging. And at the time in America, it was the time of hellfire and brimstone. So the people who were practicing the New Thought teachings were really at risk. They were known to be, they were thought to be occultists and they could have actually been thrown into jail for practicing what they understood to be the truth. So Some places uh, would still probably do that today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. So Ernest Holmes he did a lot of exploration in the realm of psychism and mm -hmm. but didn't dare to speak about it publicly because he would have been jailed for it and as as time went on the teachings became more widely acceptable and he, Ernest Holmes never wanted this teaching to be a religion he said everyone could benefit from learning how to use their minds properly and he gave lectures in L.A. And, and talked to huge groups of people. And he said, you can be a better Jew if you use this teaching. You can be a better Catholic if you use this teaching. You can be a better Christian. It's all about learning to control your mind. And it doesn't really have anything to do with a religion as such. The people around him wanted to organize as a religion. And so it was, I think it was 1926 or 27. They formed a church called the Church of Religious Science. So nearly 20 years, nearly 100 years ago, that's when it became officially recognized as a religion. Like I, like I, I was kind of joking, but, but kind of not. It seems like there are, are still places that exist today that would definitely penalize you or make you, if at least, feel like some sort of an outcast.